There's history here. And here. There's history there. History is everywhere. I'm Ann Billiter. I'm the, not yet. <laughs> Please, not yet. I'm president of the uh, Rogue Valley Genealogical Society, and I want to welcome you to here today. This is the last of the quilts and genealogy programs of this season. But I wanted to share with you something, one of those things that happens to you in your life when you're, you know, you're thinking about the double wedding ring quilt because you're going to tell, give a program a year from now, and then each month you think, I better work on that program, and you know you're going to talk about the double wedding ring quilt, but you haven't really done the research yet. I was at an estate sale. And this was hanging on the wall. Oh my I have never seen a picture, a drawing of a quilt that had this exact pattern because these are diamonds. I'm going to pass this around. Please treat it carefully. So I bought it because I thought, even though it's paper art, not, it's so depictive of. The, the double wedding ring pattern. And it's such a beautiful and a different idea of how to, to render the details of the quilt. One of the most interesting things about this pattern is this detail, that the border is almost always the ring. It isn't squared off. And it's a, uh, one of those things that makes it a very distinct pattern. OK, now you can. We'll get started with some of these slides. Thank you. Well, that didn't work. <laughs> Let's try that again. Different implement. What happened was I have the same slide at the beginning of the end of the sh and the end of the show. Okay. So the double wedding ring pattern is two interlocking rings, and it, it's been traced all the way back to the fourth century Romans, which I think is pretty amazing. The quilt pattern first appeared in 1928 in Capper's Weekly, and the pattern, of course, has about 40 different names. Most quilt patterns have a multitude of names. Regional names appear all over this country and elsewhere in the world. Um, and the, I mentioned the traditional curved edge. The folklore is that newlyweds who sleep under a double wedding ring quilt that's given to them as a wedding gift will result in a blessed marriage, good dreams, and good luck. That's kind of a triple whammy. Now, how did we get this quilt? Harold Priest was the donor. He, this is what he told the Jacksonville Museum quilters when he gave it to them. It was inherited by him from his wife, Benita Ray Bentley Priest, who was a stepdaughter of Leo Lauren Furry. That's where the furry name comes in. It was given to her by her mother, Margaret, Margaret Mildred Bentley Ray Furry, wife of Leo Lauren Furry. And it was given to her by her mother-in-law, Mary Isabel Caton Furry, who was the wife of Frederick Enoch Furry. Now, you're going to learn a whole lot more about these people. But I t can't tell you how many times I tried to figure out the best way to sequence this <laughs> so that it made sense. I had to study the notes several times before I, I tried doing it the other way around. Couldn't do it. So let's see what we can learn. Who were the furries? We're going to go way back to the possibly the immigrant ancestor, Christian Furry. He was born about 1750 in Alsace-Lorraine, which at the time was in France. It's the one of those places that kept moving between France and Germany, depending on wars and border changes. He removed to Dauphin County, Pennsylvania, and thence to Berks County, Pennsylvania. Dauphin County, Pennsylvania was formed in 1785 from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And the importance of that is that he's found in Lancaster County. But he didn't move after that. It became Dauphin County. And that's one of those little details that genealogists can really stumble over if they're not paying attention to their history. 
So he's found, Christian is found as early as 1773, recorded in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And I'm not going to read all of this. It's pretty small, but that f I'll, I'll give you some ideas. This is the first column is woodland. So I think this is saying he had 35 acres of woodland. He had 45 acres of cleared land, quit rents, and I have not studied this, so I can't tell you. It says one half. Um, he had two horses, two cows, six sheep, no servants, no Negroes. Remember, this is Pennsylvania. Um, and his tax was 17 shillings. Now, I'd have to do a lot of studying to be able to tell you whether he had wealth or was relatively poor. But if you look at some of the people in that column for how much woodland they had and how much cleared land they had, he's certainly not in the larger numbers. OK. He, this is where I got some information. It was on the Find a Grave website which may or may not prove out. It depends on what kind of research people really did. But it was actually um, the, the author of the notes on Find a Grave is give, gives it. He says Tom Brochure. And he says that George was the son of Christian. So we've started with Christian, and now we're moving down to George. And you can see this is where I got my information about Christian. George B., and he almost always appears with that B. And I think, since I've been doing this research, that that's because there were a lot of other George Furries running around in Pennsylvania. Not helpful to research. He was a veteran of the War of 1812, and he married Elizabeth Lavenberg in January of 1812 in Berks County, Pennsylvania. You remember Christian removed to Berks County, Pennsylvania. Elizabeth was the daughter of Augustine and Catherine Lavenberg, also of Berks County. And George's daughter, George and Elizabeth's daughter, Sophia Hannah, was born at Catawissa, Columbia County, Pennsylvania, in 1813, just a year after their marriage. That's important not because of any descent from Sophia, which is not who we're following, but because it places them on a specific date in a specific location. George, Elizabeth, and family, who had grown, wasn't just Hannah, Sophia Hannah anymore, removed to Perry County, Ohio, somewhere around 1824 or 1826, which is pretty early. Here is the record of George B. Furry in the War of 1812. It indicates that he started and ended as a lieutenant in the 1st Regiment of the Pennsylvania Militia. This is just an index card. There may be more information about his military service at the National Archives. I didn't pursue that level of detail. In 1820, I found George and his family in Columbia, Catawissa in Columbia County, Pennsylvania. And in the 1820, 30, 40 censuses, they only give numbers except for the head of the household. So we only know for sure that George B. Furry was the head of the household. In the household, there were two males under 10 which would be Hiram, who's three, and Jacob, who's one. Then there's a male identified as being between 16 and 18. And I'm guessing, because there isn't a child that fits that age, that it's probably a laborer or a relative or a hired man. These are guesses. And then the census did a really weird thing. They wanted to count how many males were between 16 and 18 and how many males were between 16 and 25. So they counted males between 16 and 18 twice. Throw statistics into a whirl. Uh, and then one male, 26 to 44, and of course George was 32 at the time. Two females under 10, that would be Sophia and Veronica, and one female, and that would be the mother, Elizabeth, who was 25 at the time. She noticed she is younger than George and a total of seven people. The total is why I went back and realized 16 to 18 and 16 to 25 overlap. Now, by 1830, you remember that biography had said that they moved sometime in the 20s. And here they are. They have moved to Reading Township, Perry County, Ohio. And I know that's very small, but I wanted you to see the context of this census. The census taker actually identifies the first group as the total of Somerset, the second group as the total of Perry Town adjoining 
Somerset, and that means township. The larger geographic area that in the Midwest and the East are called townships. And then the lowest part where George is found is just Reading Township. It's not, in other words, he's not adjacent to Somerset or to some of that adjoining area of Somerset. Um, and to make it easier, I blew it up. So you can see George B. Furry, and the first set of columns are the males, and the second set of columns are the females. Um, and it shows a male under five, that would be John, born in 1829. Four males, five to nine, that would be Jacob, 11, Franklin, nine, Samuel, seven, and they had an adoptee, Frank Moyer, and that's, I only know about that as a result of what's in the Pioneer file and what's in the other book that's in our collection that is called Furry Family Group Sheets compiled by Bonnie Furry. This whole thing is full of family group sheets. That's all that's in here. Amazing collection, wonderful collection. Okay, um, then one male 10 to 14 is Hiram, who's 13, and then George, who's 42. Two females, five to nine, and that doesn't fit my knowledge of the children in that household. So I don't know whether they got the, the number in the wrong column, which could happen, or whether they didn't, the person answering the numerator's questions didn't know, just knew there were two daughters but didn't know how old they were, or whether there were some other children in the household that weren't part of the family. That can happen too. We just don't know. It's a total guess. And then Elizabeth, who is now 36. I couldn't find them in 1840. I found a George Furry, but the children's ages didn't match at all, so I decided, and he was in the wrong part of Ohio. So I just decided there's probably either he was overlooked or the transcription's so bad nobody can make it out. Now, 1850, hurrah, they're now writing down the name of everyone in the household, thank goodness. George is now 66, six. Six. I guess that is a six. Um, Elizabeth is 55, Harriet 16, Elizabeth is 14, and in the household is Augustus, and it's really hard to read that last name, Lazenbu, Lazen, the um, transcriber on Ancestry says B-A-U-G-H, I do not see that in there. And way over here on the right, it's really hard to read, but you know, computers can sometimes really help when they zoom, when you zoom them. I think it says lunatic. Okay, but we think it's possible that he is Elizabeth Lavenberg Furry's brother. We think that that last name may be close to what her last name was, and you know, it was German, so who knows what happened to the name as it was translated and as people pronounced it. So this is still, they are still now in Somerset in D Perry County, Ohio. There was a very interesting quadrennial, quadriennial enumeration done in Ohio. And I was able to find this at the Family History Library on their wonderful microfilm. This is actually um, of Reading, which is the township they were living in, in 1851, so a just a year after the federal census. And it's only an enumeration of white males over 21 years. And it was taken in March and April by the assessor and filed in April of 1851. He was pretty efficient. And there he is. It's a good thing I could find blue arrows to use. <laughs> it's, I didn't try to blow this one up. I just wanted you to see the kind of thing. All they did was list them. And he's listed 1 through 10. And then he starts over. Only it isn't. It's 1 through 9. And then that's 70. And then 1 through 9, 80. 1 through 9, 90 tricky. But there's George and all you have is his name. You just know he's a male over the age of 21 living in Re Reading Township in 1851. If we hadn't been able to find him in the 1850 census, this would have been a wonderful clue. And we think, supposition, that he is buried in the Somerset Methodist Cemetery in Reading Township. Perry County, Ohio, because that's where his wife Elizabeth is buried and where their son, who died in 1847 at the age of 18 years, is buried. 
Now, I don't know why the stones are so different. The, obviously, Elizabeth's looks like an original stone, very worn. And who knows what may, he may have had a stone and it may have disappeared. We know there's lots of vandalism and other things that happen in cemeteries. John's looks a lot newer, but it may just have been a different material that lasted better. Now, George had a son named Samuel. Samuel was born in 1823 before they moved from Pennsylvania. So he was born in Pennsylvania in Berks County. And Sam lived in 1830 with the family. Don't know what, we couldn't find the family in 1840, so I don't know. He was 18 at the time, but probably with the family, but there's no guarantees. A lot of times that young, they really moved out of the family fast. Um, and I could not find him in the 1850 census anywhere. I know that his mother died, and this was kind of sad. And on April 7th of 1851, his mother died. In October, his brother Jacob died. His father died a year later in Rushville, which is in Fairfield County, which is adjacent, right, very close by. And that's where two older brothers resided in Rushville. They're, they raised their families there, they're buried there. So we don't have proof that George is buried with his wife. He could have been buried, but I couldn't find him in Fairfield County. And Hiram died in Rushville in 1891 and Franklin in 1886. That's Samuel's brothers, older brothers. Okay, this is the next place we find Samuel. He is in Iowa. We don't know quite when he went from Ohio to Iowa since he can't be found in the 1850 census. This is eight, April 3rd of 1853. Mr. Samuel Furry is being married to Miss Amelia Barnaberg. That is an A there. It perhaps should not be. It's not the way the Barnabergs spell it today. But that is what it says. And then the rest of it is just the kind of information that county clerks record. It does tell you that they were married by a minister of the Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, and when it was actually registered and who the county clerk was. This is on one great big long line in a great big book. So I just chopped it up to make it uh, more, a little larger for you. <coughs> if it were all across the screen in one line, you wouldn't be able to read it. Okay, here's the furry family, Samuel's generation. He married Amelia in 1853. And in 1854, their first daughter, Martha, was born in New London in Henry County, Iowa. In 1857, John was born. In 1860, Frederick, remember Frederick, he's important, was born in Burlington in Des Moines County, County Iowa. And I have just, this is a theory I developed all on my own with no basis. I think maybe they were just starting west that they were waiting for his birth to start west. I could be wrong. Or the, as a stop, you know, the next place to go. Anyway, the next one we have is born here in Phoenix, Oregon. Donna, and then here in Phoenix, Martha and John, the first two born, have died. They died in 1864. There were a lot of bad things happening in 1864. A lot of children died then and a lot of other people too. In 1866, twins, Leona and Edmona, were born. And then their last child, Arthur, was born in 1870. All of them born in Phoenix, except for, uh, of the survivors, except for Frederick, who was born in Iowa. And here are two different photographs of Amelia and, Bar and uh, Samuel. And as you can see, these are both photographs at the Southern Oregon Historical Society collection which uh, we have a, a working arrangement with. We will help them with our resources when they have someone preparing a presentation and they will help us. Doesn't they look grim? Don't they? <laughs> Some of that's because they had to hold still for the length of the time it took to expose the photograph. Um, it looks to me like she aged a lot more than he did. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. They didn't know what all they had to do. Yes. Okay, now of the surviving children, um, one of the twins died older than the babies, but fairly young. 
So Frederick, remember Frederick, married Mary Isabel Caton. Donna married John Graffus. Edmona married William Edgar Anderson, and there are lots of Anderson pioneers in this valley. Arthur married Arlie Carlo Carolita Culver, which is another big Phoenix pioneer name. And here are Samuel and Amelia with their four surviving children. And I just put their birth years to give you a sense of how, when this might have been taken. I'm not going to do the math. Um, but I love this photograph. I think this is a terrific photograph. Samuel died in 1899. Amelia lived till 1911. And Arthur died in 1927. And they're all buried in the, the large plot um, in the Phoenix Pioneer Cemetery. And you will see um, one of the sides of this gravestone in a later shot. You can see some of the individual stones that surround them in the plot. In fact, I think here's Carolita right here in the foreground, a little hard to see. Fred, remember I said they remember Fred? OK, here's Fred. The two different shots of him. One, obviously, he's a pretty young man. I, I'm very bad at figuring out ages looking at these photographs, so I have no idea how old the one on the right is. Um, and I've just given you his birth year and his death year just to kind of help us keep track of these people. And here is the woman he married. Mary Isabel, and she was often known as Belle Caton, was born in 1867 and died in 1947. And um, again, no dates on these photographs. I love the one on the right. It looks just like her. Does it? So who were the Catons? We're going to leave the furries for a few minutes and go to the Catons, because now we've introduced them into this story. Milo Caton was born in New York in 1827, and I did not try to push him back any further. It seemed very iffy from the quick stuff that I looked at, and my time was somewhat limited. In 1846, he enlisted as a private for the Mexican War in the Ohio Infantry. So he's now placed in Ohio. And here is a record. I love having this kind of information because it's official out of a book that says Company G was mustered in June 24th, 1846 at Camp Washington, Ohio. And they were mustered out in 1847 at New Orleans, Louisiana. So one of the things that I'm always surprised by is how far they traveled during those wars, during their military service. And then we find him getting married to Sybil Freeman in 1847 in um, Huron County, Ohio. And the minister of the gospel was Almiron Brown. And, the, and it occurred in Norwalk. I love it when we have an exact place name instead of just a county. Counties are big. All right, here's more about Milo. In 1848, his son Edwin Butler was born in Ohio. In 1850, their daughter Jenny was born. In the 1850 census, this is tricky. All you genealogists pay attention. The 1850 census was supposed to be filled out based on who was living in the household on June 1st. This particular census was taken on November 7th. It took that long for the census taker to get around. And this is in um, Comstock, Kalamazoo, Michigan. And so two children are listed, one of whom was born June 10th, after the official census date. And she was listed as 5 twelfths. So she was five months old, but still should not have been written down in the census legally. But how nice for us that she was. Mm -hmm. This happens to be, you'll see this all, it seems like everybody I was researching was on two different pages on the census. So there are, they're living in the Butterfield household. I put the arrow by Milo. He's only 22. Sybil's 22. They have a two-year-old and a 5 twelfths. And they are in Michigan. Now, back to Ohio. In 1859, Milo Caton bought land. And I am definitely not reading this to you. 
but I thought you would enjoy seeing this official document. It's two pages. And one of the most interesting parts of this document, for those of us who attended Judy Russell's seminar last September, is that near the bottom, and the said uh, wife of the said John Geyer being examined by me separate and, oh, I'm having trouble reading it separate and apart from her said husband, and the contents of said deed made known and explained to him, did declare that she did voluntarily sign, sell, and acknowledge the same, and that she is still satisfied therein. Basically, she's giving up her dower right she is to this land. She's agreeing that they are selling this land, giving up her right to her interest in it. And I love the fact that they took her aside away from her husband and his supposed influence mm -hmm. to be sure that she was truly consenting. Okay, in 1860 they are in Wood County. They had just bought the land the year before. Um, and there's Milo and Sybil and Edwin and Jane and Emily and Benjamin is 80 years old. Benjamin is assumed to be Milo's father, partly based on this evidence. There's, that's quite a span. It's quite possible that somebody 80 could have a 33-year-old son, but that's not proof in and of itself. It's a clue. Um, and then there's a laborer also living with them down there on the bottom line. And they are in Gile the village of Gilead in Weston Township. Now, in 1860, they had a whole separate form called that was to be filled out by the enumerator as an industrial census. I'm sure they had special rules about who this was to be filled out for. This is products of industry in Weston. And Milo Caton indicates that the name of his business is Boots and Shoes, the type of business, not the official name, that his capital investment was $200, that he has 400 pounds of sole leather valued at $100, two male laborers who cost him $36 total a month, he has 75 sides, identified as upper, for $230 value, and other articles valued at $10. And his annual product is 357 pairs of boots and shoes valued at $800, and his other work is valued at $75. Look at the detail. Don't you wish you could find an ancestor in this census? Wow. In 1860-61, he was a councilman in Gilead. He was a commissioned in 1861 as a captain in Company H of Ohio. You know that we're talking now Civil War. In 1862, his daughter Emily was born. In 1863, he was at Chickamauga. I did not go into any more details about his Civil War service. Um, just wanted you to be aware that he is a Civil War veteran. Now, there was a deed in 1866, after the war, and this is even more explicitly stated. It says, and I, Sybil A. Caton, wife of Milo Caton, in consideration of one dollar in hand paid, do remise, release, and forever quit claim unto the said grantee all my right by way of dower in and to the above premises. And she was taken apart to make sure that she wasn't under his influence and that she truly agreed to this. This is one of the rights that we learned that women did have even that early in our country. The dower right, this was the end of that. Here's the part about being examined separate and apart from her said husband and making sure the contents were explained fully to her. We don't know whether that's implying that she was illiterate or whether it is simply a legal requirement that that language be included. Okay, whoa, so they sold the land in 1866. By 1870, they are in Rock Point. In, uh, no, not in Rock Point. Rock Point is their post office. There weren't that many post offices in this county, and people traveled a far piece to get their, their mail. So you don't really know from this exactly where they lived. It gives you a vague concept. It was in Jackson County. Um, and his first name was just massacred by the enumerator. Merlot, 
That's what it looks like to me. But everything else matches. We're pretty sure that we really have the right people. In 1880, they are in Jacksonville. And I forgot to point out another name we need to watch. The bottom name in 1870 is Mary B. That's Mary Bell, Mary Isabel, Caton, the one who married Enoch, Frederick Enoch Furry. Okay, so here she is. She's three. Now she's 13. Milo is shown here with one of those wonderful cards that has all kinds of information about his service as a veteran. It tells you that he was a captain in Company H in the 21st Regiment of the Ohio Infantry. It tells you that in 1891 he filed for invalid status and received an appli he, his application is such and such a number and his certificate is such and such a number. So he was qualified, considered qualified. And up in the upper left hand corner it tells you he's dead. So that was indicated at the bottom line, 9 November 1913, and he died at Phoenix, Oregon. It also tells you that he served in the Mexican War and which um, service he was in. And it says, I'm not sure, anyway. You get the idea, there's a lot of information on one piece of, of paper that has luckily been microfilmed and scanned. Okay, so Mary Isabel Bell Caton, Milo's daughter, married Frederick Enoch Furry on the 15th of September in 1886 in Jackson County. Here's the affidavit for the marriage license, and this is one of those things that genealogists want to go back in history and strangle somebody, because how in the world could they have written Mabel mm -hmm. instead of Mary Isabel? And notice how it's corrected. I should be using the pointer. Can I do that? Maybe not. There we go. See this? That's Mabel. It looks like Mabel F. Caton. And here it's Mary Isabel. And you can see how darker it is where it says R.Y. and Isabel. Fascinating. Somebody wasn't paying close attention. And then, oh, and I forgot to say that down up here is his, her father, Frederick E. Furry. I'm not her father. Her husband. Her, that's one of the two people getting married. All right. <laughs> the, bro the groom. Okay, so here's the actual marriage certificate and um, it tells you something else. It tells you where exactly they got married at the house of Captain M. Caton. So he is being referred to by the rank he had in the Civil War. And, and he may have been known as Captain Caton in this area. How about um, turning up the air conditioning? Does that sound like a good idea? Yes. All right. Okay, here we are. Here's Fred and Mary Bell. And then the, um, the first, their firstborn was Frederick, but he was known as Milo for his grandfather. And then Nina is the baby. Here are Bell and Fred's children and their spouses. So you can see we have Milo on the far left, and then Nina, then Robert, then there's a little gap, and then Leo, remember Leo, and Raymond, and Sybil. And you can see the last names of their spouses. I'm zipping through there so you don't see one that you're not supposed to know about yet. Okay. This is a great pho photograph, another one of those group family photos that you just treasure. This is Fred and Isabel, and in the back row, and I will tell you that I did some detective work because they, these names were not given. So I went, I was able by the, the gender and age, approximate age, to identify all except this one and this one. I wasn't sure which was Frederick Milo and which was Robert. So I went and I didn't make images of them for you, but I went to the World War I draft registration cards and looked at the description. And F Milo is described as 
short in stature and with dark hair with a little bit of gray. And Robert is identified as middle stature or medium stature and light hair. So I believe that I've identified them correctly. You did. Thank you. Thank you. See, I really don't want to make any bloopers when there's somebody here who knows. I just have an interesting comment. Maybe you have it in the more history later on about the Caton family. Uh, the father, is it Milo? Captain? Milo, yeah. He had come out to the West at some point in time. I'm not sure when decided he wanted to bring his family out. But he had enough wealth that he went back and they sailed on, a, on the old, what's it, Constitution mm. from, I believe, New York. And they went through the Isthmus of Panama. Mm -hmm. And I presume they went on donkeys. Or mules, so yeah. I recently went on, well, several years ago, went on a cruise. And they showed us the construction of the canal. And it showed that at that time they had a train uh -huh. that crossed the isthmus, and I'm positive that he brought him by train. Yeah. But then he went, they came up to Sacramento by boat, and then he went from here to Sacramento with his buggy, or his whatever. Whatever. Brought him back yeah. up to Jackson County. Yeah. I thought their traverse was quite interesting. It is. I've always been interested to, to learn about the ones who went east to get on a ship to come around rather than traveling across the plains. Of course, six months is a long time to travel across the plains. OK, now in 1900, I know this is small, but here are Frederick and Mary. And that's, I swear that says Mary J, but we know it's Mary Isabel, or B for Belle. And then um, I think that actually says Miles F. Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. This is Climax Precinct, and it did have a post office. Um, anyway, this is the children, including Leo. All of the children aren't born yet. Leo's not the youngest, because um, this is only 1900. In 1910, they have the rest of the children, Raymond, who's your, My father. your father, um, and Donna, who's younger. Um, and here in the household is, I know it's really small, but there's Milo. Caton, right there, father-in-law, and he is, boy, it's even small here. Can't read it. It might be 84. Okay, I'm not going to do the math, but you get the idea. And there are a lot of other people in the household. They are boarders, and the bottom one is a student. Okay. 1920, they're living, uh, the precinct is named as East Phoenix on Pacific Highway. That was the address that's, on the, that's in the uh, vertical column to the left of the one I cut out. Just part of that, may I say, that Raymond was born in the house that's on, White House that's on Centennial Golf Course. OK. And that's an historic house, and I don't think they can do anything about it, mm -hmm. about destroying but, it. But right? yeah, it's got some they preservation. They moved from there to Phoenix, and I believe when you're talking about those other people in the household that they had a hotel. I think I read that, yes. And I'm sure that probably was. There were those extra people. Extra people. In the mm -hmm. And did she do the cooking? That's what I want to know. <laughs> okay. So Frederick died in 1931 in Phoenix. It is Frederick that we were following there. And here he is. This is just to the, the left side of that gravestone I showed you earlier. Samuel and Amelia are to the right. Um, with Mary Isabel. He died in 1931, and she died in 1947. Um, 67 to 47, that's a long, good long life. Now, they had a son, Leo. And in the 1930 census, he is living with his parents. He's 31, he's single, and for occupation it says P-K-I-N-G. And then for um, industry it says vegetables. So I believe that he's either packing or picking, I don't know which, <laughs> vegetables. And then the next year, his father died. Frederick died. By 1940, we find him in Visalia, in Tulare County, with his wife, Mildred, 
and his stepdaughter, Bonita Bentley, who's 12, but who in 1935 was living in Tacoma in Pierce County, Washington. Now, this is not um, chronologically giving this to you. This is giving this to you the way I found them and then worked back to figure out who the heck these people were and where they came from. This is the way that we do the, our detective work. So I found them, and one of the neat things is that it says that both Leo and Mildred are living in the same house in 1935 that they are in 1940. So that tells me they were married by 1935. I didn't know when they got married, between 1930 and 40. And I couldn't find it for the longest time. It was one of those things that drives you crazy. Um, in 1940, he's a packing foreman in, for oranges. Well, that makes sense. There's a lot of oranges growing in California. Okay, so here's what we know from the donor, Harold Priest. He told us that he inherited from his wife, Bonita Bentley, that she was the stepdaughter of Mildred and Leo Lauren Fur Furry. That Mild and, and he referred to her as Mildred Bentley. I didn't know whether Mildred was born a Bentley and had a child out of wedlock, or more likely this was a second marriage, and that Bonita Bentley was her daughter from a first marriage. You don't know that. You can try not to make assumptions. I think it was. Well, we're going to get that story. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I was able to find thanks to newspapers.com when we still had a subscription to it, in the Los Angeles time, an intention to marry. Thank goodness. I really looked hard to find a record of their marriage. So here they are, Furry Bentley, Leo L. Furry, 33, and Mildred M. Bentley, 26, intending to marry in Los Angeles. So who is Mildred? I said this part already. In 1930, I went looking for her this would be before her marriage to uh, Leo, and I found her, Mildred M. Bentley. She's a lodger in the household of Scots with a father-in-law and a mother-in-law, Miller. I could not find any connection to Mildred with Scots, so I think she literally was a lodger in their household. She's 22. It says she's married. So in 1930, she's married, but not a widow, not divorced. Okay, so that's telling me that she did have a maiden name other than Bentley, unless she's lying, and which people did. She was, it says that she was age 18 at her first marriage, so that helps me figure out, okay, she should have gotten married about 1926. That would give me a more finite time to look for. Uh, she can read and write. She was born in Washington. That's another helpful clue. Her father was born in Sweden and her mother in Denmark. She speaks English. She's a packer in citrus fruit for wages. Do you see how Leo and Mildred might have come together? She was the fastest packer I ever saw in my life. Really? <laughs> and she was employed. That, there's a question there that asks if you were employed on the yesterday or the last regular work day is the language of that column. And she says yes. In 1930, I also found Bonita R. Bentley, age 2 and 11 twelfths, rooming in the Byram household with a married daughter, Thompson. And I can't find a connection to Byrams and Thompsons. So I don't know how this child came to be in this household. <laughs> it's not totally close to where Mildred is. We think this is Bonita, her daughter. The age is right. The name is right. There's no proof. Okay, But they are both down there in um, nearby counties. It's not too far apart when you look at the map. But I th try to think about 1930 transportation. I just don't know. It may have been one of those really tough things where she says she's married, but she seems to be single. In, in living, and she's got a child, a little child that's not living with her so that she can work. OK. Now, I have to tell you, this was one of the hardest records that I have had to find for years. 
and I was at the Family History Library and just about to give up. I'd tried all kinds of things here at home, I'd tried things there, and a nice volunteer said something like, how are you doing? And I said, well, I'm kind of frustrated. And I'll be darned if she didn't say, well, just write down a couple of names and let me see what I can find, and she found it. <laughs> And she found it by being less exact in her search and then wading through the results. And even after I saw it, I still don't know why the more exact search didn't turn it up because there was nothing odd about the indexing or the transcription. I mean, it's, it's for heaven's sake, it's in type. But anyway, there it is. They, she, she and Harry R. See, I didn't know what his first name was. R. Bentley were married in Yakima County uh, in 1927 on the 24th of February. Hurrah. Okay, the witnesses don't have names that seem to connect to their families, as far as I can tell. So then I wanted to find Harry R. Bentley. What's his story? And I went to the marriage register, which is where they recorded this marriage certificate and the information about the marriage, and, and it gives you more information. It tells you that Harry was 22, that he was, it was his first marriage, and that he was a resident of Benton City, Washington, and that he was born in Washington. He was a rancher, and it gives his parents' names. Thank you so much. <laughs> On public family trees, which I try not to look at, but when I get really tight for time and can't find it anywhere else, I'll look for clues. It's stated that a Harry R. Bentley died on the 1st of April in 1868 in Imperial County, California, and, and find a grave provided additional information. It said his mother's maiden name was Fowl, which is pretty darn close to Powell, which is what his marriage registration said his mother's maiden name was. So I believe this is the same Harry R. Bentley who was Mildred's first husband and buried in, in California. So I thought that was interesting too. Heaven knows whether they kept in touch. So back to Mildred. This is what it said on the marriage register for her, that she was 19, it was her first marriage, that she resided in Benton City, Washington, and was born in Washington, had no occupation, and of course it gave her parents' names. Hurrah! Morin, now I know her maiden name, M-O-R-I-N, and I was able to get more information about her father, David Gustav Morin. And this was one of those, it popped right up. You know, you, you look and you look and you look and you look for one record and then the next one just falls into your hand that you should never be able to find. It's a Swedish birth record, for heaven's sake. And it's hard to read. He's the bottom line. It says David Gustav is his name and it get, for his first and middle name, and his last name is shown right here, M-O-R-I-N. His father was Carl Johann, or Johannes. And this, I believe, is saying where he was born or is living, and his mother's name, too. Wow. Okay, I didn't pursue this any further, but I had to share this with you. It's sometimes ancestry just pops up with what you're looking for when you least expect to have success. All right, so here he is in 1910 in Seattle with his wife Katerina, who was born in Denmark, um, and their three children, including Mildred M. There she is. She's two years old, born in Washington. But notice the other two children were born in Michigan. So they didn't come straight from Sweden to Seattle. There was a stop in Michigan. So that would be fun if I were pursuing this any further, which I don't have any intention of doing. And they had a border. Now, there's some really important information in this census. It says that he arrived, Gus, he was known as Gus, arrived in 1897 and that he's naturalized and that Katerina arrived in 1901. This is 1910 and the first child was born seven years earlier. So my guess is that they were married in the United States, but I don't know that, it's just a guess. If I were pursuing this line, I would look further. In 1918, his wife died of pneumonia. She was only 38 years old and Mildred was only 10. 
1920, two years later, Gus is residing in Keona in Benton County, Washington, which get, gets her to Benton County. He's now a widower, aged 46. It says that he arrived in 1897, and it tells you what year he was naturalized, 1906. And there is another child. Carl was born after Mildred. He's only eight. So he was really young when his mother died. Okay. In 1927, Gus married again, Betty Marie Christensen, in Benton County. In 1930, they're in Benton County with a daughter by his second wife, who's 10 twelfths, and Carl is living with them, his son by his first wife. Um, so Mildred has a half-sister and a, a, a full brother. In 1930, another child is born, Betty Jane, but in 1936 she died. In 1940, he's residing in the same location and owns a farm worth $2,000 with his wife and his daughter Esther, who's now 10, and Carl is living next door, is single, and owns his own farm, valued at $180. Um, and in 1948, he died in Yakima at the age of 74. So that is Mildred's father. Now, Bonita Bentley, I tried to find her birth record. I was having a terrible time. I did find this index entry, and it's a terrible, it really wasn't a very clear image in the first place, and I had a little trouble reproducing it, so it's even fuzzier. But it says, Harry R. Bentley was the father and resided in, I don't know whether this is resided in or the child was born in Spokane City on the um, 20th of May of 1927. The child was unnamed, thank you, darn it. The mother was Mildred Morin, that's pretty definite. Um, and, f and the child was female, so at least we have the right gender. All right, so then I went one step further and found the birth certificate, which still doesn't have a name. No name, it says. It's just not fair. Okay, and uh, Harry was 20, and Mildred was 19 when Benita was born. Well, we think it's Benita. And it says that Harry's at school since he's 20, I'm assuming this is um, some kind of post-high school education. So, I have never been able to document Bonita's marriage to Harold Priest. I simply can't find a marriage. I'm certain that they were married. It's possible that she was married before she married him and that he was married before he married her and you know, she had a different married name many times Subsequent marriages get record, marriages, second marriages get recorded with the wife's first married name instead of her maiden name. Mm -hmm. Even when it says right on the questionnaire, maiden name, that's not what they fill in. I found um, two birth records, or birth indexes, in the California Birth Index for a Catherine Elaine Priest who had a um, mother's maiden name, Bentley, so I'm pretty sure this is really Benita's children, Catherine in 1950 and Martin in 1959. I found Harold and Benita in California city directories from 1956 through 1979, not every single year, but many years, and I just listed the, the cities. So you could get the idea that they were in that same general area. And then the Publ Public Records Index also locates her in Bellingham, and she died in Bellingham in 2010 at the age of 83 and I can't find her death certificate. I can't find an obituary. <laughs> so frustrating. And it is often hard to find more recent information than it is a older information. So now we know that Harry R. Bentley was Mildred Morin's first husband and that they had a child, Bonita Bentley, who died in 2010. Harold told us that. That was one of the most helpful things he did, besides giving us this wonderful quilt. And then she married second, Leo Lauren Furry. So here's the story of this quilt. It was given by Mary Isabel Caton Furry, who was the wife of Frederick Furry, to her daughter-in-law, Mildred Morin Bentley Furry, who was the wife of Leo Furry, and she gave it to her daughter, Bonita, 
who was the wife of Harold Priest, and when she died, Harold inherited it. Harold, in turn, donated it to the Jacksonville Museum Quilters, which returned it, and this is why he did it. He wanted to return it to where the furry family pioneers were, which was in the Rogue Valley. And when you think about it, the reason you didn't know anything about this quilt is because Leo was the one child who grew up and left the Rogue Valley. He lived in Southern California. He raised, he, he and Mildred raised their daughter, Bonita, down there. They didn't live here. But they were through here every year. Were they? As per, he was the manager for American Fruit, and so they traveled the West Coast mm -hmm. and all up to Washington with the apples. We knew, I knew that she had a daughter, Bonnie. I never met her. Mm. Uh, but uh, I knew that she was from a previous marriage because I knew they didn't have any children. Right. And I'm just thinking about what you can give the history if, if Grandma Bell gave a wedding ring quilt to them when they got married so and the, that they could yes. sleep under it the first time. <laughs> that, you know, that's, it's a good, good supposition. It's a good hypothesis. We have no way of knowing. When we documented this quilt, the um, Genealogy Society has a document, quilt documentation project that's on hold right now, but we've done several um, documentation projects. And this is one of the quilts that we documented. And the fabrics are dated in the 1920s and 30s, which means that Mary Isabel could very well have made them, have made this quilt. We, there's no way to know that she did, but she could have been the actual quilt maker. It's one of those things that we tell everyone over and over again, please sign your quilts. Um, and all, every time we have a story like this, we think, well, I wish she'd signed that quilt. But it's a good supposition that she did indeed make it and give it to Leo, who was the last of her children to marry, who did marry after his father died, and then, but lived elsewhere. But I'm so glad to know that they came through regularly. Yeah, every year. Every year. And that's when I got to see, he, he taught me how to pack pears. Uh -huh. And then I watched her, and she was what we called a slap packer. She went in the box. They weren't wrapped. Uh -huh. And then my mother later on became a, an instructor, and she had made me wrap every pear that went into the box. <laughs> Those are kind of fun things to remember. They really are. They really are. So let's see. That really is the story of the furry family quilt. Um, Harold did bring it back to the valley. He gave it to the Jacksonville Museum quilters. When they lost their, um, their museum, their location, and realized they were just storing quilts, not being able to show them, um, they came to the Rogue Valley Genealogical Society with a proposal. We were in the middle of making this building we just purchased into a library. And they proposed that we build a display that would showcase one quilt at a time and that would also very carefully house appropriately the other quilts in the collection. And that is what we have done. And the agreement is that they may take a quilt to show it at various locations, but it, they now belong to us. So that's where the furry quilt is, and it's, it's here. It's available when um, there is a reason to take it elsewhere. Is Mr. P is Mr. P still living? You know, I I've, that's one of the many things I tried to find out. I even looked again this morning. I cannot find any record of his death. Um, I would like to communicate with yeah, him. He was. he was living in Eugene, and it looks to me like he may have a son who has his name, who's so he's junior who's in that area, and I'm assuming that perhaps that's why he lived, he moved to Eugene from Bellingham um, after she died, because to be close to his son. Uh, he would be in his 90s. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Very much. Yes, I think it's time to turn the lights on and to thank you all. Thank you.